my name is Dominic Campbell. I'm a, a bureaucrat turned uh, tech entrepreneur type person. Uh, I've now reached longer in my career doing tech from the outside than doing tech from the inside of government, which was a bit of a, a strange moment for me because I've never really left the sector. So it's uh, it's an interesting one to realise I'm more uh, private sector now than I'm in government. Okay. That's my business model. <laughs> so what I want to talk about really quickly is um, this. So I didn't really know what to talk about because it's a bit weird. Like we're we're kind of like a company that's born modern and open standards and don't really understand how to talk about open standards and APIs without just taking them for granted. Um, so I've had to do a bit of thinking around uh, what's relevant. Um, but for me, I think what I've learned over the last seven years of running Future Europe is, uh, and, and advising government around this stuff is uh, it's really kind of time for us to start putting our principles out of procurement and uh, politics when it comes to the way that we build services, and in particular the way that we build digital services. And a lot of that comes down to you guys. So it's, uh, my talk is going to be a bit of a rallying cry, which is just do it seriously. Like, let's just move into the modern age in local government and local digital services and start to make open just a standard that we uh, that we put our, our sort of leadership behind and our commitment behind. That's where I learned everything I know about local government, the hotbed of innovation, uh, as it was by Nick Council. Um, and learns an awful lot about crack technology and the ills of closed systems and systems that don't talk to each other. I was privileged to waste some money on SAP, um, which was uh, delightful, amongst other case management and other systems, and have spent seven years trying to make up for that. Um, and I think the key for me is that what we didn't have was design thinking about them. We had big change management, we had big ugly systems that cost a lot of money, uh, and to be honest, what we were really trying to do uh, was just to stick technology into a broken system and hope that that system would magically work if we suddenly put a load of disconnected systems together. Uh, and unsurprisingly, it didn't. It didn't particularly change the organisation, it didn't particularly change the way of working. And I've become a real convert to design as a way of thinking. Uh, we do this stuff around the world. The, pro the, the project I'm going to talk about um, is actually in Australia because for me it's probably the example, the world leading example that I can I can think of in um, social services in particular around why you should be doing this stuff and why you should be advocating for this stuff. And for me, design is at the heart of everything you should be doing in your work, um, not technology. Uh, technology is really just one part of the story. So a lot of what we do is is to support government to think about. Services like real services, like as in how human beings consume services, rather than how policy papers and legislation construct services, uh, or how restructures construct services. So people want to report a misfit, and that is a service. They want to renew their driving license, that is a service. Uh, homes adaptations, repairs, and reablement is not a service. Uh, that is just a bunch of words. So what we need to be thinking about is that, uh, and in order to do that, what we need are open systems and a collection of technology that are well connected to each other that actually help us design the kinds of services that real humans consume and then around that build the kinds of organisations that we think uh, we, that, that will be able to uh, support those services. Um, and in order to do this, what we need to be thinking about is customer needs and business needs. It's really interesting how few people in the business are actually coming to conferences like this. I will die a happy man when the director of children's services deems it important enough that they spend two days at Socrates event and that they come away feeling that they have had the value that they need to go back and change their services because they understand the value of digital and they understand that technology is there for them and there for their customers, not that they are subservient to whatever system gets foisted upon them uh, with false promises that take two years to implement. Uh, but instead that we build the kinds of technology and connect it together in a way that is seamless and actually delivers services to people in a way that makes sense to them. So the project that we're working on at the moment, the New South Wales Government, it's called the Safe Home for Life. It's a $500 million reform. 
which is about 300 million pounds, um, of which about 20% uh, is allocated to technology, which I'll come back to. Um, it's the biggest policy reform in the Southern Hemisphere, I think, at the moment. And what they're doing is changing policy, practice, and technology simultaneously through a kind of iterative process where they try something, doesn't work, they try a policy change, they build the technology, they see if it works in practice, and it all works together. Imagine trying to do that in a, in a world where technology is fixed and disconnected. It's pretty much impossible. And where the solution that we love so much in the UK is one system to rule them all. Uh, sensibly, they're not taking that approach because no system is good enough in its own right. Um, so one of our apps, Patchwork, is how we ended up working down there, which connects a lot of frontline workers. But one of the struggles we had with that, as we've had in the UK, is that everyone agrees it's a good idea to connect the front line of the police with the front line of health, with the front line of whoever. None of them are willing to stake their own leadership and their own reputation and their own principles behind opening up those systems in order for this to become a seamless connection so that practitioners can actually do what they need to do to get their job done. Uh, and that changed when uh, Safe Home for Life came along, because what they've done, and this is it's not very often you get government sending you a pencil sketch for a two-day agenda uh, saying, come along to this event, uh, it's going to be great and we're going to invent the future of looking after children in care and child protection. Uh, but that's what we did. Uh, we invented a process called Prototype to Procure with them, which was uh, spend six months prototyping and testing new kinds of technology and before any form of procurement, um, which was interesting, and even when they went to procurement, Splattered all over it were user stories, personas, real life people and users of systems, and the importance of open standards in order that suppliers who weren't like that just didn't even bother applying in the first place, which is what they've done. It's acted as a brilliant filter for that, uh, that world. It's essentially said if you're staying in the past, you're welcome to come with us into the future if you like. Uh, and that took strength of leadership, it took a real passion and commitment to new kinds of services and new kinds of technology. This was us and others coding with practitioners and carers and caseworkers, children and young people in the room. We tested it live with them for six months. And what we've ended up with is a platform approach. And within, okay, get this right, blank piece of paper to live share client record between the practitioner and the child and their family in six months. Tell me who would have even got close to finishing writing a procurement document in six months. This went from a pencil sketch to live into people's hands in six months. Uh, now, that again really takes a commitment to believing that data should be open, can be open, and that it's worth us testing and prototyping different approaches. That they had design principles behind it, that they, did. That they had customer needs at the heart of everything. And technology was the, was the servant to those needs, not the other way around. Uh, but those principles drove everything about openness, user experience, frictionless uh, way of working, collaboration and uh, portability, leading to things like this shared client record, which was beautifully nicked as a visual uh, of Facebook, as I'm sure you recognize. But, uh, this is what kids and, kids and families get to see in terms of their record. Uh, and also get to contribute to it as well. But for me, all of this is not about one-off projects, right? What they're doing there, they're building capacity within government to be able to work with people outside of government in order to build a responsive organisation. The beauty of openness, the beauty of APIs is that you can build a responsive organisation, one that is open to change again, one that doesn't take someone like me wasting 12 million quid on SAP just for it to be ripped out by capital eight, seven years later, uh, which is exactly what happened. Um, instead, what it means is that you actually have a collection of small technology that works beautifully together, that allows you to switch out small things for other small things, and actually helps you stay at the front of innovation, supports entrepreneurs to help you do your job. What you need to be doing is seeding different skills, different mindsets, pollinating a new corporate approach where you take designers you take people who understand open standards and digital and you spread them through your organisation to redesign services. Services that might help people with disabilities to get a job or find housing. Services that they actually understand and that are fully joined up. Um, 
But for me, if you take away anything from this, like we talk about a legacy as if legacy is inherently evil. Legacy in itself is a neutral word, word right? Legacy doesn't have to be a dirty word. What I, what I really want you to go away and think about after this session is really, what do you want your legacy to be? As the people who are leading this agenda in the UK local government, as the people who literally have the keys to the castle, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to make mistakes I made? Are you going to continue to buy these systems that you know are not right? Are you going to continue to have these disjointed services that don't stick together? Or are you going to finish your career as proud of the fact that you've built responsible organisations that enable us to build the kind of local government that we need going forwards? So I'll leave that to you. Thanks very much. Hi Dominic. Hello. Sean Green from London Borough Tower Hamlets. Nice to see you again. Um, <clears throat> it's not about the technology. Um, I'm interested in some of the activities and the investment on the change side to change the mindset, to change the thinking. You must have come across in the project you know, a number of resistors or people who say it's not possible to do it that way. So just could you perhaps um, Describe and discuss some of those areas for us. Yeah, I think I mean it's a really unusual situation from my experience. There's uh, the director general of the agency, the head of practice, the head of uh, the CIO, um, and the, the chief financial officer are all of the same mindset simultaneously. I have not seen that anywhere else. Um, so I work in places where the head of IT is perfectly visionary but doesn't have the clout at corporate management level. And I still think it's a scandal that CIOs don't have a place on the management team at most councils because that's bananas in 2015 uh, as it is one of the main drivers of everything. Um, but this, I mean the project in New South Wales is just, uh, it's, what we found with that and with patchwork and with, and with being able to build technology is that the build and the design and the invention and the uh, listening to the practitioners and the end users, the clients, is the change process. Um, so being able to work with people in that way, rather than what I used to do for my students, was draw an organogram and then shove it down people's throats until they change, right? And that just doesn't work, unsurprisingly. Uh, restructures get you nowhere, it's the last thing you should do. And instead, what we said are what actually are the challenges you face, and how can we rapidly prototype and build belief that change is possible and new is coming, uh, rather than two years of blueprinting to get the product that is off the shelf anyway, um, which is generally what happens. And, and that process and that involvement is exactly what, what wins people over, even the most skeptical people. Nice to be here. Uh, it wasn't true because uh, Belgium is quite in a turmoil. Uh, the railways are striking. I didn't find it. But happy to be here. Um, there is quite a similarity between open data and uh, ICT. The possibilities those two things create to change the way the public services work are tremendous, but there's somehow a worldwide consensus not to use them at, in, at full length. Um, I've been doing this job for 11 years and I've heard all good reasons not to use ICT except for what I've named uh, big styles in our bureaucracy. Our procedures of 150 years ago, we are now doing with computers. I liked the uh, previous speaker saying I used to type. Well, no, we don't use typewriters anymore. We do that. This is just the same thing on laptops or maybe even iPads. So that's modernization. Same goes for open data. Um, my good friend Andrew Stott has a beautiful presentation also listing all the good reasons in the UK not to open data uh, and completely. Now there's in Belgium, like everywhere, a whole group of people very enthusiastic about open data, naming and listing all the possibilities it gives. My angle is mostly what can we really do with it? And uh, I'm talking now about two uh, projects we have done, European projects, 
Citadel on the Move, which has been running for three years, is now finished. But the results are there, and I'll start with the end. They are there, go to the website, uh, and you can use those two tools for free, uh, for whatever reason you like. What have we built? First, the converter, uh, so that you can, from a simple Excel file, you, know, you have to save, save it in CSV, but that's fine. We uh, convert to the JSON file, which is standard, which is needed for mobile applications. But while converting, we asked, are you talking about a park or parking? Uh, what's the uh, precise address of these things? Uh, what uh, are the comments you want to give about this, in, um, this point of interest and so on? Um, the Citadel on Move projects also allow for census data for people uh, as citizens uh, correcting or uh, putting more information to the data. One of my favorite examples, and which I have always uh, named, the application for high need. Where is that public toilet for men, for women, where you can change the diapers of the baby, and so that citizens can say that one's closed uh, after eight o'clock, that one's dirty, and so on. Uh, well, you know what, how it goes these days. And then the app generator turns that JSON file into a basic, simple app without any effort. Of course, if you want one with more, uh, how do you call it, pomp and circumstance, then you go to a serious developer to, but here you can choose the, you can put your logo on it, cho choose some colors, and in less than an afternoon, without any cost, you've got a uh, mobile application for whatever data you want to put on the web. We've uh, built one ourselves in Thomas, uh, and I quite, quite quite like it because I use it myself from time to time. If I go to a concert in a place I don't know, then the app shows me the restaurants, hotels, uh, even the doctors in the neighborhood because you never know what happens when, while you're there. And on the other hand, if and remember that one, if you're on a, in a hotel somewhere in Flanders, you can use the app the other way around. What's happening tonight, this weekend, this week in the environment of the hotel? And you can choose one kilometer to 50, you want to go to theaters, uh, concerts, or uh, walks around in the city. That's becoming quite popular because I quite believe in pushing the demand from the citizens. Now they are asking their villages and cities, why don't we have this kind, these kind of applications while in the village next door they have it. So that's bringing things into movement. Uh, citizen on the, uh, Citadel on Move has been quite successful. Um, there are more than 150 cities now really using the application, as far as we know, because you don't have to write a nice letter telling us you did so. We know it, it was done in 64 countries worldwide. I uh, got even requests from uh, New Zealand and Australia to start using the Citadel tools. We know of more than 600 different applications, and the philosophy of Citadel was also to break it down. Uh, if you build an application, because it's more or less standardized, that application will work also in another city, which has uh, published the same data in the same uh, form, uh, uh, standard. So, uh, the Citadel on Move was made with uh, four pilot cities. Manchester, Ghent in Flanders, uh, Issy de Moulineau, which is near Paris, and Athens in Greece. And uh, in these days, I just love saying the partners from Greece who were also built a big part of the tools in Citadel were one of the best. And it was with pleasure I sent money, uh, well, European money, to them. Um, <laughs> really, the last uh, payment was exactly in the week. Uh, when the Brexit was or not was or was not going to happen, I could send 300,000 euros to Adams. That's fine. <laughs> uh, and the other project, and that's uh, started beginning of last year, is now halfway, and is quite promising as well. Is Ken with open data, but this time open geographical data. And we've got a quite wide definition of open. Data in for geographic, of course, it's maps and so on, but it's also 
and one of my favorite examples is what a citizen or a contractor wants to uh, share with people uh, or other companies themselves. For instance, in many cities, well, at least I know in France, we've got a structural application where you can check on all the public roads which are um, not accessible because there are some contractors uh, putting new concrete in the, in the street. That's covered. What's not covered is when another contractor who is rebuilding my house puts a lorry in a small street and you can't get past this by a car. We took that idea from Amsterdam who has built kind, this kind of application for their emergency services so they know which streets to avoid when they're rushing to uh, an emergency um, because, and it works right there, people share themselves which roads are blocked for one reason or another. But um, another one, and I always hope that someday uh, open transport network that's the name of the project will save lives. If well, I'd say my house, your house, is burning in the middle of the night. It's very useful that fire brigade knows that on the first floor at the front is a bathroom. The kids are sleeping on the second floor at the back. So they rush immediately to the right room. Of course, that has to be very secure because a burglar would like to know also where you keep your jewelry. But um, it's, as I said, it's quite open definition of uh, geographical data. What are we doing? Um, we collect, or at least facilitate for a city, or a citizen, or a company to upload geographical data in a hub, uh, at the same time standardizing it, putting the right metadata on it. Um, as, a, as I said, the definition is quite open. Um, traffic accidents, uh, the partner in this project from the UK is uh, Birmingham. Um, and again, uh, the city of Antwerp in Flanders, ici de Moulineau in France, and the Czech region of Liberec uh, are working on this project. And they've all got their priorities. Um, and the idea is the technical partners built applications, built the hub, built uh, a number of tools, and it's now being tested by citizens in the different pilot cities. And at this moment, but it's just started the testing, the citizens aren't very happy with what the technicians have delivered. So they are forced, I'm forcing them, uh, because that's also the contract, that they have to adapt their tools to things people really can use. Um, the next speaker, and I've looked very quickly at your website, we are, this could help companies like yours to use open data from, this, uh, from the uh, villages and cities because we are uh, stimulating, making it easier and standardizing the way open geographical data are published and then it's really in the philosophy of the project very explicitly that uh, whoever wants, the city itself, citizens, enterprises can build new innovative applications with the data we have uh, published. And the slide on top, you won't be able to decipher it, but it's quite spectacular if you see it. That's uh, the city of Antwerp. There's an enormous political world problem since 10 years already about uh, new public transport, uh, new public works around the city. Uh, they want someone to new highway, uh, the first design a bridge, now it's going to be a tunnel, five lanes, six lanes, seven lanes. What the Czechs had built in the beginning of the project was just visualizing all the data. So now the mayor, if he wants to, can play, oh, let's make it six lanes, and then you see how the traffic in and around the city is uh, changing, finding other uh, roads, or is, uh, if you take 10 uh, lanes, hopefully they will not drive that much through the city as they used to. Uh, Birmingham is using it more with uh, uh, data on uh, safety and accidents. And you can really see by just using some slide, slides um, at what time in the, on the, during the day 
week, weekdays, uh, holidays, and so on. Uh, where are the black spots in terms of uh, accidents, so that you can put your uh, safety uh, investments to the right spot. I would like to be uh, within the 10 minutes, so. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'd actually like a show of hands to see if anybody in the room was part of the Cabinet Office initiative we did last year, where I managed to raise some money up the Treasury to look at funding data innovation in local authorities. Did anybody take part in the local authority incentive scheme? <coughs> well, possibly some of your colleagues. But I'd like to say a thank you um, from, from myself and from the Cabinet Office team, because that's actually um, one of the foundations for what I'm going to talk to you about today, the data future, with a new administration in charge, newish, and, and, and exactly what um, what the new role for data is in the UK. If I try to frame that, I would say data capability, um, and I'll explain that well, as much as I can in 10 minutes. But as a web scientist, our vision from 10, six and a half years ago was we have to make sure we deliver on the promise of it for everybody. Because 20 years on from what you did in CERN, it certainly wasn't. And we're, we're entering a new era for data, and that's basically, I can't give you a background to that, not enough time, but I will see in the future as best I can and give you some, some use cases of what we can do, so at least it will be relatable. Um, we're one of the cloud's most successful SMEs, and we back the UK cloud strategy before it was a cloud first strategy. Um, we took the first UK financial services company to the cloud. Uh, seven and a half years ago, I created Mayhem there, I'm a banking specialist, and that was deliberate, and I've disrupted the industry every year since, at the bank last year, because I've been pretty fed up with the change that's not there for us as citizens. But we built on G Cloud because the safe harbour arrangements were not going to be good enough for us to move forward <coughs> from a web point of view. And so we built an alternative to that, and we've used G Cloud as a delivery mechanism. And when we started that work with him, we had 18% of the world online and a vision for what that looked like to build to 80%. Um, just publishing a new book, which we'll briefly talk about, and we, I did the calculation again, 43% plus of the world online. Tipping point is now inevitable. And the, the adoption um, from, by citizens for the web um, is our future. English is no longer dominant online. It hasn't been for some time. We use 270 languages in our lab. We localise in 16, and predominantly Generation Y, those millennials that everybody talks about, they're actually uh, predominant on the web. They'll be in charge of the world in a, a very short amount of time as well. So everything we build is built around those foundations. But the, the core foundation of all is the cloud service is the only thing that will take us to that vision of the future of 80% of the world online. So, this was a phrase, big data, that the technologists, I mean, I was guilty of it, but certainly many of my peers were, to create a hack cycle for some time now. And we've had to, because the demand has been there, to create what we call the eight data platforms that solve that particular problem. But the realities of it, the data challenges that are faced by organisations are not actually about big data. There's only three of those eight um, platforms that really do anything to do with big data. Um, from the original definitions when Doug Laney stuck his paw in here and, and, and uh, created that change. Some of you may know of my work in Cabinet Office as an independent ministerial advisor for the last three and a half years on open data. It's not about open data either, although open data has been a successful mechanism for reimagining the transparency agenda, and, and I've obviously helped power that piece. It's the first step from a web scientist point of view on the maturities curve to get us to the data future that we need as citizens. So what's it about? It's actually about data. That's the raw resource that we as web scientists envision the way of building that future. If you hear the terms, Tim talks about uh, webfree.io, um, and there's numbers put to everything these days, I know, but the other phrase that you might hear about is the web of residence. And the idea that in 10 minutes I can give you a flavour of that with five books, seven and a half years work and, and all the rest of it. I'll do my best to see the future, but I'm actually around at the rest of the conference and the dinner tonight, so, so um, sit me down and ask your questions there. 
Is anybody familiar with this work um, that Brad Solis did? This was the first time that we had evidence as web scientists that the future we envisage was working other than from our own lenses on the world. We have a web observatory when the 16 are out there. And so we can see the way that the organic um, progress and path of the web's gone. But Brian Solis released this in 2013. This is Prism 4. Um, my data engineers say, explain it's not that Prism, Jackie. Not that Prism. What this is is a digital ethnography of the social networks. It shows the breadth and the variety of social conversations. But this was the first one that says there's no single voice. There's no single audience. There's no single <coughs> story. And this is the first public signal we had that the end of the web 2, the end of the web of text, the end of the social web itself to move us to our next place. And, and now, where we are now, it's not possible to find that signal in the noise. Not just because it's, it's a, an engineering challenge to even get to that, but because the disintegration in the signals across the web, as such that your, if you use this mechanism, is inaccurate. And, and so the data platforms that we operate have to take a new view, because that's not the intelligence that we should use when we use, not with the, where we are on the web. So on the 8th of October, we had him stood up in London, and we were all there to announce the new data future. Six years of work for us all at the time, and, and it allowed us to do our pivot of Lime Mine in September 2014. We now only build the web services that he talked about in that speech, um, and we've moved on beyond traditional big data approaches for the reasons I've just articulated, because the social web isn't reliable. Our Internet of Things Award, which, which some people I know are aware of in general, was actually the recognition of the data platforms from moving us from a data science agenda to a data engineering agenda, but the citizens at the heart. Because as web scientists, that has to be so. But that required a new trust and privacy model to be built and to enable citizens to influence the direction of travel. An example of that was this. So post the Snowden revelations, I'm a data journalist, so I, I, you know, I understand what Ed did and we, as an industry, we've, we've moved on from that into a direction to support that initial piece of work. This data platform actually is built out from our web observatory. It actually allows us to use this new trust and privacy approach in the web, something we call VPI, Volunteer Personal Information. It works at a city level because we're smart city specialists and that's the, that's the, um, the route forward as far as we're concerned for local government hubs. And it actually allows citizens to, re to respond directly, anonymously, to our wicked questions about what, what it is they need, to contribute their views on issues that affect them. And these data streams are, can, are communicated to a wider audience as data storage using our data journals and um, uh, techniques. Um, this one actually happens to be part of open policy research we did in education. Uh, it's delivered by the Duke Cloud Programme. And we now have 600 educational specialists working on this arena and moving us towards our first data-driven organisation in government. Mentioned it briefly, over four years ago, Flying Barry co-created the data journalism industry with the work we did in the Guardian when we took the WikiLeaks world, um, WikiLeaks centers of the world, and we asked citizens to comment on that. We now have a 34 million strong global audience that help us to understand when we don't understand what next steps are and what matters where. And certainly from the smart cities point of view, that's key for us. Um, Tim Miller's lead regards us as pioneers of the use of data on the web. This hashtag is what you can use if you want to join our world and get a lens. Um, I have a, an opportunity, we're launching our new book in November. If anybody's around on November the 4th, um, if five people can speak to me, they'll get an invitation inside of that world. And so that new um, communication approach that we're using, that we're launching in this book, is in response to the fact we lost some of our data journalists um, in the Charlie Hebdo Mexico. And we now realise that we're actually on the front line. And we, so we've had to change the way we do things. But this has been key to our smart city and internet things work. So I'm working as part of an international ISO standards team on this whole data piece for smart cities. This is the initial PD. Um, it's also available in Mandarin because my Chinese colleagues have got to build 200 smart cities. Um, and they, they need all the help they can get. And so we've, we've done it as a joint venture. We've now signed an MOU with China in terms of a memorandum of understanding, in terms of bringing this work forward to help them when we're collaborating. As you know, the Prime Minister's entertaining um, China today. 
And these standards were all created assuming that the overdose use group work that we all did, in particular the policy piece that we launched before the last administration went into powder of the national information infrastructure. And that is the lifeblood of our cities, and that is the data capability piece that I'm involved in, in building. There's a suite of these standards now. Um, we have smart cities all over the world adopting them. We have our own core cities that are moving the agenda forward as well. The initial focus has been on strategic guidance and literally leadership by like themselves, which is why I'm so keen to be here. Because actually, um, this is a commercial opportunity for local government because this is part of an international agenda. I'm the technical author of the New Jersey British Standards for Smart Cities and we're going to take it to the next level now because we're look at, going to look at data capability across our UK smart cities and how we move that agenda forward. And I'm keen to talk to anybody in the conference that wants to be part of that work and put, put what you see in local government to work in UC standards, which will go on to be the ISO standards. I'm currently putting the original British standards through the ISO committees. So this is a, a collaboration agenda across the world. Um, so if you do have something that you want to contribute and use cases and, and, and experiences are a piece of that, then I'd love to involve you in your work. I'm an NHS entrepreneur and I've previously created change across the entire state with data. However, today's landscape is rather different and has been rather problematic. And so this actually was a culmination of three years' work to get NHS England to take account of this new web world, which they did. And it's, it's uh, enabled the new five-year strategy to have this built in. Five binary core technology suppliers, they're all due to have platforms that underpin this initiative. And what does it do? It creates an evidence base for and on behalf of citizens. And it's related to changes that we as patients, we as carers, we as citizens need to see in the NHS. And this allows individual cities and networks to determine their own health policies. You'll see what's done in Manchester and the six million that Charles have put out there. That's because some of this evidence base is, is changing the transformation, but we do need to work collaboratively for that. I've mentioned the Internet of Things. It's a reality across most of the, the, the world. Uh, it's having transformation impact on many sectors. And our recognition in 2014 was for our work in Asia, in Scandinavia, in Europe. Um, but not in the UK, because we're not on this agenda. Um, but the sectors that are leading the, that work are construction, advanced manufacturing, materials handling. And it's a huge, this is, Internet of Things is a huge commercial opportunity for local government. Hollywood invests on a three times multiplier, I've just been there for some money to, to get to the, to the next level of what we need to do for GFCAD 8. And in, in, in the Internet of Things, in that work we've done external to the UK, we've recognised a times two multiplier, three to a times 40 multiplier. That's the possibilities on this. And I would say the Internet of Things is a strategic response to the current budget climate, which is not going to go away. It's not going to be pretty much negotiable. I managed to work on money out of the last year, but it was a painful process. Um, and so in, in some respects, we can't meet the, um, the changes that we need to make, make, make in local government on an efficiency agenda, in my opinion. The Internet of Things allows us not just to leverage what's going on there, but to make it a commercial proposition. So I'm conscious of it. It's been a whistle stop tour. I'm speaking really fast and I hope you're picking on time. I don't know what Brian is or not. <laughs> just about. Right. So we're delivering these changes on the, the GIS agenda. So geospatial data is at the heart of, of this new direction for the web. And these G Cloud platforms directly address the policy questions around IoT. Because what we've realised over our G Cloud deliveries is if we can affect policy, we can affect change. So we're very much focused on that agenda. Um, and this particular geospatial project is about what's the impact of 20 million additional computers as a result of opening the Crossrail um, infrastructure project. Now that would have been good to us some years ago and not last year, or earlier <laughs> this year, but it wasn't. However, this same data platform allows Crossrail engineers to plan changes to what we in Smart Cities world call buried assets, i.e. what's happening under the streets of London. But it's the same platform, policy change and, and buried assets. So it's a, a multi-purpose thing delivered <coughs> under the security, uh, the security agenda, which is underpinned by GPL. 
So when people say to me, well, it's about the data, that's the new oil. Hmm, disagree on that one. Really, the products, the services, and the value were not created from oil. They were created from petroleum. So just being able to manage the raw resource, just being able to open it, just being able to do it big, well, that won't allow me to create the future hubs of government from a smart cities point of view, and to embrace this internet of things world, which we're heading towards with an alarm and rate not. Um, those that create the data, however, those that do the services that the petroleum um, focus will lead that way. And, and therefore, you as leaders are in charge of that agenda, which is why it's important for me to be here today. I'm happy to take any questions. Hello. We're a bit of a shy audience today, I'm sorry. Um, so Jackie, it's fascinating. You're kind of taking us into the next generation of thinking. And very much welcome talking to you later. But um, what, what sort of help do you want us to give you in terms of local government? You know, what, what can we do practically? If we're not involved directly, I'm working for a London borough, what if we're not involved directly with smart cities? How do you want us to help? What do you, what do you want us to do? Well, I've got a, um, a moratorium on what I can do without the Treasury getting involved until the end of December, so I'm going to do something quick as the first thing. Um, the British standard that I'm writing, literally I want your views included in that. There's a variety of ways we can do it, but I, I want, to me, this is the commercial opportunity to just, you know, say, cuts or no cuts, this is where we are. So between now and the end of December, I'm looking for a way in which local government has that voice to put into that British standard. Because that will become a global voice, and that is a real push forward, a strategic push forward towards a commercialisation opportunity. So I'm, as I say, I'm around, and I'm, I'm more than happy to chat to anybody, but I'd li actually like you involved in that, contributing directly. It's not time consuming, and we can do it in many, many ways, um, but I'd actually like your voice in that British standard because I 